die for us. So, God, I pray, Lord, that, that we receive tonight, Lord, what you've put before us. And, God, not only receive it, but, God, that we might live it, that we might respond to it. And, God, that we might draw closer to you. God, we pray, Lord, as people have gathered here today, Lord, if they're burdened, if they're struggling, Lord, I pray that they would realize that Jesus cares for them. And, Lord, that they'd cast their burdens upon him. And so, God, I pray that you'll meet with us in this place tonight. And, Lord, that you'd bless us all as we're here. Lord, we give you all the praise, all the glory, and the honor. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Brother Tim.
This is our first time trying to sing together, so, well, we've, we've practiced a couple of times, so you can pray for us, and we'll do our best, so. Make a joyful noise. That's right. <clears throat> first time but I guarantee it won't be the last <laughs> you just found your you just found your niche so it's going to happen again eh? but this side's filling up look at you showed up you know the problem is with the church this size is it's easy to spot you when you're not around you know Amen. so thank you all for for your participation this week um Ms. Ann, if you're watching on live stream, thank you for your house. We've tried to leave it in good order. Um, but, uh, you know, we looked, at, we looked at our phone last week before we flew back here, and it said it was going to rain three days, so we brought all the rain stuff. No rain. <clears throat> so that, that's all right. But... Uh, I, uh, I want you to take your Bible, and if you would, turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 18. Now, some of you are going, you preached that one last year. I know, but I didn't finish. So I say what I didn't preach last year for this year. So turn to 1 Kings 18, and, and uh, you know, for some of you who think all, all we preachers do is is uh, preach on Sunday morning. Um, trust me, you, you'd be amazed what we do. But you've been on my heart now for about five months trying to figure out what I'm going to preach at you and, and talk to you about. And, and uh, you, you may think I just picked all these sermons by the seat of my pants. No, I didn't. I prayed about them. I tried to put them in order. 
And, and you remember, it, now let's, let's see how well you've done. Sunday morning, we preached on God's formula for revival. Thanks to the two of you. Bless your heart. That's good. <laughs> and, and, and we looked at 2 Chronicles 7.14. Yeah, no, we did. And then Sunday night, we came back, and, and we spoke to you on Romans chapter Abandoned by God. And you remember how we concluded that sermon. The solution is what? Second Chronicles 7.14. Right. And, and then Monday night, we, we talked about living to capacity. In other words, you know, one of our problems we're having in our churches, folks, is we expect, expect God to do things that we haven't worked for. And sometimes we expect preferential treatment. And, and, you know, we need to understand that he's given us the blessing. And what we need to do is live up to the blessing we have. If you want more blessing, you're going to have to live up to the blessing you got. You want more revelation? You're going to have to live up to the revelation he's already given you. And, and you remember I told you that one of the problems I have is that when it comes right down to it, Baptists have more truth than any group I've ever met in my life. And we're not living up to the truth that God has given to us. So we talked last night on the potter and the clay, did we not? We looked at Isaiah chapter 45, and um, we talked about being the clay in the hands of the potter and what that means. So tonight, I, I want to finish with this message, and, and I want to propose a couple of questions to you, so just... Hear me out. If, if I could give you something tonight that I promise you would infallibly work, that you could put into practice and know the authority of God's word, it would work in your life. If I could give you something that would literally transform your life and make everything the desire of your heart wants it to be, if you could see life change and people consistently being saved and walking down the aisle, if you could see Christians grow mature and quit gossiping, backbiting, and bickering, if you could see all your financial needs met and money in the bank, I just want to ask you, would you be interested? There you go again. Have you not learned yet? It's okay to speak at me. Would you be interested? Yes. Hmm. Okay. You remember you said that. Because that's exactly what I want to share with you tonight. It's nothing new. Matter of fact, when I tell you what this is, some of you are going to snicker in your heart. You're going to say, oh. <laughs> but I'm telling you, you, you need to tune in and stay with me long enough to let me finish what I want to say to you. And, and I'm telling you, I, I learned this several years ago. But I cannot tell you how God just keeps refreshing my heart with this truth. And I see it over and over and over again that when Christians put into practice what we're going to talk about tonight, things literally change. Matter of fact, let me tell you where I've come to in my life. I believe that what I'm going to speak to you about is the number one requirement of a Christian. Now, hear me. The number one requirement of a person in this world is to get saved. Okay? But after you're saved, I believe what we're going to talk about tonight is the number one requirement of a Christian. And when I tell you what it is, and you think I'm off my rocker, then you just answer in your heart, then why is it the devil keeps you from doing this like he does? You know what it is yet? Prayer. Number one requirement of a Christian is prayer. Now, I'm not talking about saying grace. I'm not talking about emergency prayers that when all hell's breaking loose, you finally get around to asking God for help. 
I'm not talking about just praying when there's nothing else going on or even leading the pastor lead you or the deacons lead you or the ushers lead you in, in a corporate prayer. I'm talking about getting right on with God and you praying to God. I don't want to simply talk about prayer, folks. What I want to talk to you tonight about is big prayers. Praying like you mean it. And I'm going to start you off by laying down a spiritual principle and before you want to raise your hand and ask me questions, let me prove my point. We'll go from there. I believe that God does nothing but in answer to believing prayer. Let me say it to you one more time. God does nothing but in answer to believing prayer. How do you think you got saved tonight? You think you just woke up one night or one day and decided to go to church and, and you heard the message and you think you just made a decision for Jesus? Or do you think you had some people behind the scenes praying for you? Praying for God to touch your heart, speak to your heart, and bring you to a saving knowledge of Christ. Which one do you think it really was? You think you really had anything to do with your salvation? No. You think you were where were you were at when you got saved by accident? You hear the other night and you heard me tell you my testimony. Folks, God had to take me from Wickenburg, Arizona, to San Bernardino, California, put me in my sister's house, put me in Emmanuel Baptist Church before I ever heard the gospel. But I heard it. And even though those people in Emmanuel didn't know me like, like they do now, they knew my sister, and they knew she had a heart to see me get saved. They were praying for me. And, 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 you know, praise the Lord, I had a Sunday school teacher who never did follow the quarterly. He just talked on prophecy all the time, got me interested. I, I heard more things from him in three months than I'd heard going to church all my life. God does nothing but an answer to believe in prayer. Now, I know what you're saying in your heart. Fine. Can you prove that? Yep. That's why I got you where I got you. Look back at 1 Kings 18. How, you remember, how many of you remember this sermon from last year? Remember we talked about the fire falling? We talked about Elijah going to confront Ahab and, and the secret of revival and the requirements of revival. You remember that? And then he prayed and the fire fell and... and the Israelites all got right with God, and, and the result was then Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal and do not let any of them escape. So they seized them, and, and Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kidron, and he slew them there, all the prophets of Baal, the false prophets. Well, let me back you up a little bit. Chapter 17, right there in verse 1, says, Now Elijah the Tishbite, who was with the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, surely there will be neither dew nor rain except by my word. Then he takes off, and Ahab can't find him. It's been three years. Ahab's been looking for him for three years. Now, in chapter 18, verse 1, it says, Now it came about after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show yourself to Ahab, and I will send the rain on the face of the earth. So Elijah went to show himself and Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria. Now, let me make sure we're on the same page. In verse 1, chapter 18, does it not say God said to, ah to Elijah, You go show yourself to Ahab, and I will send the rain? All agree, say I. Hmm. Okay. Then you got all of chapter 18, get down to verse 40, and Elijah's done everything he does. Then you look at verse 41. And Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there's a second sound of a heavy roar of heavy shower. So now Elijah says to the king, get on chariot, get out of here. Rain's coming. But I think it's very interesting if you look at verse 42. And so Ahab went ahead and ate and drank, but Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. He crouched down on the earth, put his face between his knees. Now, I want to ask you, 
What do you call that? What's he doing, folks? Well, he's praying, but God already told him the rain's coming. So why is he praying? So he said to his servant, go up now and look toward the sea. So he went up and looked toward the sea and said, there's nothing. He said, go back. He said, go back seven times. And it came about on the seventh time that he said, behold, there's a small cloud about a man's hand size coming up from the sea. And he said, get up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down that the heavy shower may not stop you. So it came about that in a little while, the sky grew black with the, with the clouds and the wind, and there was a heavy shower, and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel, and then the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins, and he outran Ahab to Jezreel. Now here's my question, folks. Why is it, why is it that God told Elijah he'd send rain, and yet Elijah still had to pray and I would say he had to pray persistently at that. Didn't pray once. Folks, he prayed seven times until finally the servant said, yep, there's a cloud right out there. Looks like about a man's hand. And, and Elijah said, go tell Ahab to get out of here. It's coming. Here it comes. And he outran Ahab to Jezreel. Why? Why would he have to do that? If God said, and then Elijah did. Can I suggest to you, because God does nothing but in answer, listen to me, key word, to believing prayer. You know, folks, sometimes we're guilty of just going through the motion. Sometimes, folks, we're guilty of what I said to you last night, of praying with preconceived thoughts of how God's going to answer my prayer. And then when God doesn't answer your prayer your way, you say, well, God doesn't answer prayer. Yeah, he did. He just didn't do it your way. Matter of fact, let me, let me help you out, folks. If you think back of all the times God has answered your prayers, doesn't he just usually do it a totally opposite of the way you thought he was going to do it? <laughs> Why? Because God does nothing but an answer to believing prayer. You say, why is that so? Now, very important part of the message right now. Pay attention. Why, why is that? Why does that principle hold true? Because, folks, you need to understand, and, and I'm going to give you insight, why all the skeptics, scoffers, atheists, why everybody wants to skip Genesis. See, folks, Genesis is one of the most important books of the Bible because it tells you how it all started. Revelation becomes one of the most important books of the Bible because it tells you how it all ends. And if you read Revelation very carefully, you see a lot of fulfillment of Genesis in Revelation. Now, there's a great span of time between the two books. But if you don't understand, when God created man, God conferred upon man the control of his creation. God made us to rule. So what do you mean? It says in Genesis 1, verse 26, God said, let us, let us, let us. And he's not talking to the angels here, folks. Let us, Trinity, make man in our image, according to our likeness. Now listen, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Who did God tell to rule? Man. We were created to rule the world. Man was given, as, as I want you to hear me say, legal authority. Legal authority to rule this earth. In other words, folks, God gave to Adam and Eve the title deed of planet earth. How many of you own a house? Raise your hand. How many of you are still paying for it? Raise your hand. But it's yours, isn't it? As long as you can make the payment, it's your, it's your house. But the goal is one of these days, you're going to pay it off, and it's yours scot-free. And you have the title deed to prove it. What God literally gave Adam and Eve was the title deed to planet Earth. Now, you say, what happened? 
Well, Adam rebelled against God in the garden. Satan came in and deceived Eve. And Adam ate the fruit. Listen to me. Adam didn't, wasn't deceived. He ate the fruit eyes wide open because he knew what the penalty was going to be, but he wasn't going to be without his wife. So whatever she did, he followed and they ate the fruit. And when they ate the fruit, you know what Adam did with that title deed? He gave it to the devil. And Satan, that faithful hour, became the God of this world. Not the capital G-O-D, but the little G-O-D. So where? What well, says in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, talking about people who are blind, and in whose case the God of this world, little g, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving that they might not see the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ, capital C, who is the image of God, capital G. In one little turn of events, which Hollywood would never make into a picture, which nobody wants to talk about, in one little event, the entire world was turned upside down. People say, well, what's so important about Genesis 3? Because it tells you how it all happened, folks. And you see, it all started with Satan asking a question. Hath God said? See, now he told the truth. Has, has God said? And Eve said, he said, we can't eat it and we can't touch it. And she added to what God said, and Satan had her. It's very important, folks, that you know what the Bible says. Lest you say something wrong. And Revelation makes it very clear. If you add to that book or take away from that book, uh, God's going to talk to you about that. <laughs> you, you just don't do it. Adam's high act of treason brought a curse on creation, which explains why God has not disposed of the devil. Think about this. Can God get rid of the devil? Yep. Is he going to? Yep. But he hasn't yet. Why not? Because Satan's been permitted to rule this world because man gave it to him. By Adam handing over the title deed, God has been obliged to recognize Satan's legal authority to this world. Now, don't misunderstand me, folks. God could wipe him out in a moment's notice. God could blot him out in a moment's notice. But our God doesn't operate that way, does he? And aren't you glad? God's power is always governed by God's moral law. You're going to reap what you sow because, folks, we break God's word. And then God has to deal with us. But since man transferred the legal ownership over to Satan, God has respected that transaction, which explains to us why Jesus was born, why Jesus emptied himself and became a man. Jesus came not as God. He came as the God-man. He came as the Son of God, but he emptied all his authority and all his power and came and became one of us. And you see, after he was baptized, he was led immediately into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Luke 4. Verse 6. Do you notice if you read the book of Luke, Jesus never disputed Satan's authority. Every time the devil tempted him, he simply quoted the word of God back to Satan. And finally, after he had him, he said, Satan, be gone. But you see, what you need to understand is when Christ came, he faced the devil as a man. He faced him as the second Adam, which 1 John 3, 8 says, For this reason Christ came, that he might destroy 
the works of the devil. We're still together? Okay. So what happened? When Christ went to the cross, when Christ gave up his life, his perfect, sinless life, he literally fulfilled what John the Baptist said in John 1.29 when he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. There was none of us qualified. We are all sinners. So God became a man, dwelt among us, and lived 33 years on this planet and never sinned, went to the cross willingly and gave his life. But when he rose from the dead, he conquered Satan. When he rose from the dead, he was given back his authority. When he rose from the dead, he made it possible that through his sinless life, his perfect obedience, his death on a cross, and his resurrection, that not only was Satan defeated, but we could be saved. All of a sudden, folks, he had broken his authority and his power over the nations had been broken so that everyone who believed can be saved. Man can be transferred out of darkness and brought into the light. Welcome, brothers and sisters, for something you didn't do that our Lord did. But hear me, willingly. See, we go out there in, in, in the world and they say, well, Jesus got caught up in the crowd and he died, he, died a, uh, he died a martyr's death. No, he didn't. He died a perfect death. He died on purpose. He knew exactly why he was coming and he fulfilled the reason he came. He came to die for you and me. But you read, read Scripture. How many times did Satan try to get him to avoid the cross? Think about it. In the temptation, he said, if you'll bow down before me, I'll give you all these kingdoms. Listen, for they've been handed over to me. Is that not what he said? You're quiet. That's what he said. However, Jesus didn't succumb to that. And he defeated Satan. Man no longer has to be lost. He can be saved because of the redeeming work of Christ. However, there is a tremendous difference between the sentence and the execution. You understand? You can go to court and be sentenced and never be executed. Now, here's the good news. I've read the end of my Bible. We win. Folks, in, in Revelation 20, Satan, the Antichrist, false prophet, and every unbeliever, they're all cast into hell. You know, it's, it's an amazing thing, and, and this is free. It's not in the sermon, but you, you do realize tonight when I tell you there is nobody in hell at the moment. Now, when somebody dies without Christ, they're going to go to hell. But you see, right now they're in Hades. Now, it's as hot as hell in Hades as it is in hell. But they're all going to be brought before the great white throne judgment. And then they're going to be cast into the second death, which is hell. You and I need to understand that until Jesus returns and carries out the execution of the sentence that was passed at the cross. Folks, somebody has to enforce the victory that he won. Guess who those people are? And how do we enforce that victory? By believing prayer. Listen to me, folks. John 15, 7, Jesus said, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Hmm. 
John 16, 23 and 24. And in that day, you ask me no question. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask of the Father for anything, he will give it to you in my name. Until now, you've asked for nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be made full. See, when we pray in the name of Jesus, God the Father is justified to use his great power to overthrow the forces of evil. Why? Because Jesus won the victory. You say, well, I don't pray in Jesus' name. Well, then what makes you think God hears you? When you write a letter to somebody, do you sign your name? Well, let me help you out, folks. When you pray a prayer to God, you're writing a letter, you better use the right name. Whose name do you need? To use? In Jesus' name. We pray in Jesus' name. Years ago, I was asked to preach at a baccalaureate back in those days when you still got to. And, and uh, I thought that was a great thing. I, I would do it. And, and then the administrator said to me, but you, but you know, Pastor Rob, you, you can't pray in Jesus' name. I said, really? He said, yeah, we don't want to offend you. I said, well, you really probably need to get somebody else because I ain't coming. He said, well, why? I said, because, brother, you need to understand, if I can't pray in Jesus' name, it's all in vain. I ain't coming. Now, praise the Lord, Redlands High School down a few years ago, when, when my son graduated, I got to do his baccalaureate. But they let me pray in Jesus' name. Folks, what good is a prayer if we're not going to pray it in Jesus' name? Now, make sure you say, well, I ask, but do you ask according to God's will? See, folks, here's the key. Whatever you ask Jesus needs to be God's will. Now, you may think you know what God's will is, but you can pray about it. But when God answers you differently, he just straightened out your theology. Amen. Why? Well, because God does nothing but an answer to believe in prayer. Folks, what, what I'm trying to say to you is we're in the middle of spiritual warfare. Now just put this to Ephesians 6 and read it again. Paul says we're put on the whole armor of God. Is not one of those armors prayer, the sword of the Spirit, the shield of faith? I mean, folks, let me tell you what. What good is it to have Christianity if you don't exercise your faith? And how do we do that? Well, we do it through prayer. Why? Because God does nothing. You know why God's given you all those promises in Scripture? Those promises in Scripture are to show you what he's willing to do. But folks, if God's going to get it done, they can only be incorporated by believing prayer. Listen to me. God initiates, we respond. You know why you need to spend time in prayer? You know why you need to empty yourself of all your thoughts and all your wishes and all your wants so you can hear God. And God lays on your heart what he wants you to do, and then he gives you the privilege to respond. Folks, what God initiates, he blesses. What you initiate, he's not responsible for. You hear me? Are we on the same page? You're quiet again. It is prayer that God gives, or God gets the moral authority to use his power. Several years ago, there was a missionary from in the South, and I won't tell you what state, but he came back on, on, on leave, and he went to his director of missions, and, and he was responsible for 10 mission stations. And he asked them to find 10 churches, one for each station, that would literally pray and believe God for revival. The director of missions said, I'll do it. The missionary went back to his his field of service, and in a matter of months, revival broke out in seven of the churches. But the missionary could not figure out what was wrong with the other three. The problem was the director of missions only found seven churches that could believe God for revival. And the churches that could believe God were the churches that God blessed, and they had revival. Folks, let me tell you something. Here's my conviction. If the world is in shambles tonight, folks, it's because I believe we haven't seen this truth sufficiently. We keep thinking, I'm going to pray for the politicians. They ain't going to solve the problem. 
Well, if we just had more money, that ain't going to solve the problem. Well, if our church was just bigger, yeah, and that's why Jesus changed the world with 12 disciples and 120 in the upper room. Don't tell God what he can do. Just believe God can do it. Have you ever noticed? Have you ever read, you know, where, where in Acts 6, where the apostles are, are, are teaching and growing, and, and all of a sudden a complaint arises, and, and, and all of a sudden the Hellenistic Jews are all complaining to the apostles that, that they're, they're widows and, 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 and are being overlooked and not being served food? And the twelve summoned the congregation of the, of the disciples and said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God and to serve tables. But select from among you, brethren, seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and the wisdom, whom we'll put in charge of this. Now, folks, it doesn't say deacons there, but I've never been anywhere where that doesn't come out. But we'll devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. And they went out and found seven men uh, full of good reputation who served and waited and did what they did. Folks, I've always believed that the elders of the church take care of the spiritual stuff, the deacons of the church take care of the physical stuff, and put the two together. Things work wonderful. Problem we got today in a lot of our churches is we've decided we're going to have a board of deacons. There's no, can't find board in the Bible, folks. Of course, let me, let me help you out before you say, listen, can't find CEO in the Bible either. I don't believe a pastor is a CEO. But I do believe God holds that pastor responsible for the spiritual growth of that church. And, you know, we need to pray for our pastor. We need to pray for our deacons. We need to pray for our Sunday school teachers. We need to pray for our leaders. But, folks, what we need to do is start spending more than five minutes in prayer. What we need to do is get a hold of God and plead with God and ask God and trust God and believe that God's going to send revival not only to our church, not only to our community, but to our country. I'm going to ask you one more time. Do you really believe the America we live in tonight is the America our fathers founded back in 1776? No. I can't even remember the name of the guy right now, but he, he wrote years ago, he was a Frenchman, and he made a statement in print that a normal democracy only lasts 200 years until the people who live in that democracy find out they can get everything for free, and then it goes to pot. Well, folks, we've arrived. Can America go back? Yes. But it ain't going to be the Republicans, and it ain't going to be the Democrats. Now, I have a choice of the two, but that's not the problem. If it's going to happen, folks, it's going to happen because the people of God begin to get on their knees and pray and believe God and ask him for revival. But how's that going to happen? Well, we're back to Pogo again. We're going to draw a circle and say, we found the enemy. <laughs> it's us. See, we want all the blessing, but we don't want any of the responsibility. And folks, it's our responsibility. So when you look at this, hear me say this to you, folks. We can have anything that will glorify God, but the problem is we haven't asked. I always think of the story I heard about the Apostle Peter dying and going to heaven. And Gabriel was showing him around heaven and said, there's this and there's this. And they went by this great big building. And there's double doors there. And Peter said, what's in there? He said, Gabriel said, uh, you don't want to know. Peter said, no, I, I want to know. He said, no, you, you really don't. It'll, it'll break your heart if I show you. He says, no, no, no. Let me ask you something, Gabe. Am I not a joint heir with Jesus? Yes. Then did not Jesus die to give me everything he had? He said, yes. He said, I want to see what's in there. He said, well, okay. Went over there and opened those doors. And inside those doors were cars and ovens and dishwashers and washing, all kinds of stuff. And Peter looked at Gabriel and said, didn't the Lord know that we could use all that stuff down on earth? And he said, yeah. Well, then how come it's all up here? He said, because you never asked. Listen, folk, if you don't ask, how can God give? Now, listen to me. Sometimes God puts you to the test and then give you what you need. Till he sees how you're going to respond. And you know, 
I've met people who, who need this, and they ask God five minutes, and 15 minutes later, they go down to the store and charge it. <laughs> Did you believe God for it? No. Now, if God gave you the money and you can afford it, then why should God give it to you? But how many times have you seen God come through in this church with things you all couldn't afford, and God either brought it through somebody or brought it here, or, or brought you a partner, or, or something else, and all of a sudden, things were provided that you by yourself, you couldn't do it, but God can do it, and God can use people like you. See, I know I'm, I'm, I'm ranting and raving at you about revival, and you're saying, you, you, listen, this little church, yes, this little church can. We can do anything if God's behind us. And my friend, my Bible says, my God can do anything. So when we look at this, here's the problem. We never pray big enough. And when we do pray, we have to believe in God's ability and we have to pray for God's will to be done, not ours. Let me give you a verse I love. Psalm 81.10. Psalm 81.10 says, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I'll fill it. Now, I've always liked that because i got a big mouth. I open that puppy up and just swallow up everything. But this is what God says. I am the Lord your God. I brought you up from the land of Egypt. So let's change that. I'm the Lord your God who saved you out of the depths of sin. Open your mouth a little bit, wide, and I'll what? I'll fill it. Now, he just puts you to the test. What, what, what can you believe God for? I mean, he just tells you. And, and, and you see, people say, well, he's not. Don't say he's not willing, folks. You look tonight. See, this one good thing you got in North Carolina. See, not having a bunch of street lights. You can look up at the sky. You can see the stars. You can see the moon. You, you can see the planets. You can see, listen, don't ever look in the universe and begin to contemplate who God is and don't ever say he's not able and don't ever say he's not willing. Folks, Romans 8.32 says, he who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how, he, how will he not with him freely give us all things? God is able. He is willing. God says, open your mouth wide. And you see, God loves to give. That's his nature. Matter of fact, if you look at Psalm 8110 and you just meditate on it, you, you kind of get this idea. God's like a contractor. God comes to you and says, you need a job done. L let me give you my credentials. I created all this. And, and, and I, I created the mountains and the seas and the trees and, and all that. And, and then when the Jews were in captivity in Egypt, I, I sent the ten plagues and I delivered two and a half million Jews. And then I took them to Mount Sinai and, and I gave them the Ten Commandments. And then we went to the Promised Land and we split the Red Sea and, and, we, and we knocked down the walls of Jericho and, and I put the people of Israel in there and I blessed them and blessed them and blessed them. And, and if you needed a big job done, why don't you ask me? Have you ever asked God for something that big? Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. He's already got your soul. It's a good prayer, but you ought to add to it. Am I, am I coming across here? I want to come across. See, he gives us his credentials. He basically says, you need a big job done? Why don't you ask me? God is able to give us more than we can conceive. Now, folks, hear me say this to you. I double-dog dare you to find a place in the Bible where God ever criticized anybody for asking too big. So what do you mean? Think about it. A lot of prayers in the Bible. Do you find one time that God ever criticized anybody for saying... That's, no, I ain't doing that. One of my favorite stories, I mean, I, I love the story, is in Daniel chapter 3. And, and you, you remember in, in Daniel, 
you got these three little Hebrew boys named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel. And, and in chapter 2, Daniel prays to God about Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and, and God gave Nebuchadnezzar a dream, and, and Nebuchadnezzar is blown out of the water. He's going to kill everybody, but Daniel saved them all. But in chapter 3, because of Daniel's dream telling Nebuchadnezzar he was, he was, the, he was the, the, the one of gold, Nebuchadnezzar went to the plains of Dura, and he built a 90-foot statue of gold. And then he told everybody to meet out there. And, and when the Babylonian BG struck up the band, everybody's supposed to get on their knees and pray and give hallelujah and worship him. And, and the Bible says everybody showed up and the Babylonian Bee Gees hit their, hit their instruments and everybody bowed down but three. Remember the story? Say yes. Okay. Now here's my first question. If everybody was bowing down worshiping Nebuchadnezzar, how did they know if three of them didn't do it? It's kind of like being in a Baptist church and somebody come to me and say, Pastor, Pastor, did you see so-and-so raising their hands today? I said, no, I was praying. What were you doing? Oh. Folks, you know, people aren't going to go to hell because they raise hands. It's all right. If you, if you float your boat by raising your hand and praising God, that's, I think that's wonderful. But while you're doing it, you got to get on your knees and praise God in prayer. Amen. Folks, we... we, we argue over Mickey Mouse stuff that had nothing to do with people going to heaven or hell. So these, these guys come to Nebuchadnezzar and said, oh, king, you great guy. They didn't believe that. But, oh, king, we'll better you up. You, there, there's three that didn't bow down. Now, and I got to read this to you. And, and I got five minutes. So hold on. Listen to this. So they bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego before King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, folks, if you don't know who Nebuchadnezzar is, he's not a nice guy. If you keep reading about Nebuchadnezzar, he's just soon cut your head off as look at you. He's an ugly dude. And you need to understand in this story, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're still probably either teenage boys or in their young 20s. And here's the king and says, in rage and anger, oh, he says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I, I'll tell you what, boys, I, I'm, I'm going to give you one more shot. We're going to strike up the band if you bow down well, but, but if you don't bow down, it's not going to be good for you. So in rage, he in anger, he brings them in, and Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not say or serve my gods or worship the golden image that I set up? Now if you're ready, if you're ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, bang, all those guys, and, and you bow down, great. But if you will not worship, you will immediately be cast in the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. Now listen, folks. And what God is there that can deliver you out of my hands? Now, see, I think God has given to every one of us a sanctified imagination. This is where you get to lose. Listen, this, this is how I picture this. Can you not picture the Lord in heaven? First of all, watching these three kids not bow. Watching these three kids brought before a king who is the ugliest dude you've ever met in your life. And, and then he gives them a, a direct command. And then he makes a mistake and says, and what God is there? And the Lord looking at the angels. And, and listen to their response. Here's your teenage boys. They go, oh, Neb. We don't need to give you an answer concerning this. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we're not going to bow down, serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Now, can, can you imagine? I, I just like to, I, I think that put a smile on the Lord's face. And Nebuchadnezzar went nuts. He told the guys to heat the furnace up seven times hotter than it was. He told them to grab those three kids, tie them up, don't, don't, just tie them up, throw them in there. Can you imagine his reaction when they opened the door, threw the three boys in, the guards all got burned up because the fire was so hot, they slammed the door, and he looked in there, and the Bible says, and everybody there says, how many did we throw in there? Three. How many did we throw in there? 
Three. What's wrong, king? Oh, I see four. And one of them looks like the son of God. And it was. God watched their faith. And they made a statement of faith. Our God can, but even if he doesn't, we're not going to. <laughs> and God showed up, walked with them, went down there, told the fire to cool it. They came out. And folks, you got to watch this because it says it in Scripture. When they came out, they looked over these, these three boys. They still had their hats. They still had their coats. They still had their pants. Everything that they wore in was still on them with one exception. The fire had burned off the ropes that bound them. Listen to me, church. When you're in the fire and you feel bound, God can set you free and unbind you. So I want to ask you a question tonight. How, how big is your God? If I go to 2 Kings chapter 2, I love this. I, I love this. Elisha is getting ready, or Elijah is getting ready to go back to heaven. And he keeps telling Elisha to stay back, stay back. He says, nope, wherever you go, I'm going. So they finally get down to the Jordan River, and Elijah took his mantle and, and, and folded it together, and he struck the water, and they divided there, and so the two of them could cross over on dry ground. And it came about when they'd crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, now hear it, ask what I shall do for you before I'm taken from you. And Elisha said, please give me a double portion of the spirit that's upon you. Now, here's the young buck prophet with the old master, and he takes him across the river, and he says, okay, kid, I'm going to do one thing for you before we go. Ask what you want before I go. And Elisha says, well, I want twice what you had. Now, let me tell you, in my, in my flesh, I'd have slapped that kid upside the head and said, you, you punk. Wouldn't it just be enough if you had what I had? You had to ask for twice as much? I mean, he asked for a big thing. If you go back and read the miracles of Elisha, Elijah, it was big stuff, but he asked for twice as much. Now, here's the neat thing in the Bible. If you count the miracles that Elijah committed or did, major miracles, you know how many you'll find? Seven. If you count the major miracles that Elisha did, he did 14. He got exactly what he asked for. Can you imagine how much more of the Bible would be if he asked for 38? 14. He did it. Did God say, you, you who do you think? You? No. I think God was delighted that Elisha had that much faith. You turn over two chapters and get to chapter four. I love this one. I'm almost done. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord and the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. And, and I always want to say, well, if he feared the Lord that much, then how come he's that broke? But Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what, what do you have in the house? She said, you're not listening to me. I don't have anything except a jar of oil. He said, okay, go borrow a large, go borrow it large for yourself from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Then he says this, and do not get a few. That's what he told her. And then you go in and shut the door behind you and your sons pour out the, in the vessels and you shall set aside what is full. So she goes home and the boys, can you hear the boys? Okay, mom, what did he say? Oh, he said, go get some vessels, empty ones. So they went and got some vessels. Okay, what do you want to do with these? I'll oh, bring them right here. And now listen, she took a vessel and took the oil and poured Give me another vessel. She started filling up the vessels, and the oil was still there. And it says, so she went from him, shut the door in her house, and we're bringing the reveals. She poured. And it came about when the vessels were filled that she said to her sons, bring me another vessel. 
And he said to her, there's not one vessel more. And the oil stopped. Now, let me tell you what. Was it God's lack of oil or her lack of faith? Church, you listen to me? Our God can do anything. Our God can do anything. Open your mouth wide and I'll fill it. Now, don't take this personal, but I've been to enough churches, I think most of God's people have locked jaw. We don't believe God. We go through these prayers. I mean, folks, let me, let me tell you what. We go through these handwritten prayers that somebody else wrote for you. What good is that going to do you? Pray your own prayer. Well, I don't know how to pray. Just talk to God. He already knows before you talk to him what you're coming up with. But if you know you have a need, if you know that somebody has a need, I, you know, I, I'm just going to tell you this. I quit praying for me years ago. I found out he already knows what I need. I went, that gives me more time to pray for my people. Gives me more time to pray for her. Gives me more time to pray for our kids. And if I'm going through a trial or something, I can ask for that. But listen, understand, folks, our God can. Our God wants to. And I pray tonight with you that we'll never be found guilty of praying too small. So I'm going to leave it. But I want to ask you a question. Now, nobody else can answer this question for you. I'm asking you. Can you name me one thing tonight that you're praying for that if God doesn't come through, you're a dead duck. Well, I, I, I need a new sewing machine. No, you, you haven't heard the sermon. Let me, let me take you back to Sunday one more time. How long has it been since you prayed for somebody lost? Why well, did that years ago and they, they're still lost? Why did you quit? Did God tell you to quit? Did God lay him on your heart? Yeah, well, then why don't you keep praying? You know where I'm going with this? You know where I'm going? I'll quit. What, what are you praying for right now? For, what are you praying tonight about? That if God doesn't come through, you're going to be in bad shape. And like Elijah, you may have to go to Mount Carmel and get on your knees and pray and persevere at that. But I'm going to hear to tell you, God nothing, does nothing but an answer to believing prayer. But if we will pray, and if we will believe according to his will, oh, what could God do? Amen. Do you know that where our church is? We sit on 40 acres of land. Do you know we move from two and a half acres to 40? And, and we move from buildings, we move from an auditorium that could hold 300 to an auditorium in the back parking lot that, that could hold 1,000, uh, uh, and we moved out. Now i got an auditorium that will hold 1,400 and 33,000 education buildings, foot, and i got a bus barn, and, and there's an administration building. I mean, you know, folks, God has blessed us tremendously. You know, in my life going up, how many people told me we could never do that? And you know how many times I had to smile at people I loved and said, I hear you. Now, would you mind moving over and let me finish? Listen, folks. If God gives you a word, he didn't give it to him. You get his own word. Didn't give it to you. You get your own. If God gives you a word, hold on to it. Believe God for it. And pray till God answers. Amen? How many of you have at least one thing you could pray about right now? Okay, here's the invitation. Come on down. 
let's have an old-fashioned prayer meeting. And why don't we just ask God to do something that the whole world can't believe could happen, but it'll happen for you if you believe. Just get up right now. Don't wait for somebody. I, you, I saw you raise your hand. Get up here. Come on. Just go, let's pray. Let's pray. You need to sit down. There's a pew right there. Just sit down. But why don't you just go to the Lord right now? Why don't you just pray? Why don't you just thank him that he's God? Thank him that he's able. Thank him that he can. And why don't you just, if you have to, repent and tell God, I'm believing. Heavenly Father, you are a great and awesome God. You created the universe. You created us in your image. And Father, by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have saved us and put us in the family. We're adopted children. But Lord, you told us to believe. You told us to pray. You saved us, Father, to have conversation with you. Lord, I see an altar tonight filled with people. Lord, I don't know all their requests, but you do. But I lift them up to you, Father. And I pray that you would hear them. And Father, in the next day, three days, week or two or what, you're going to begin to answer prayer. And Father, when it comes down and it's answered, the only one who can get the glory is going to be you. And Father, I pray for your will to be done in this church. I pray for Pastor Bo. I pray for the deacons. I pray for the leaders. Lord, you bind their hearts together. And I pray, Father, tonight for you to do with this congregation and this church on this property what you want to do in Providence Baptist Church. I pray, Father, they reach out past Holly Ridge. I pray, Father, they reach into the communities around them, not because they have to have the biggest church in the, in the area, but I pray that they have a hunger to see people saved, lives changed, people discipled, and people coming to know Christ as their Lord and Savior. I pray you give them wisdom. I pray you give them grace. I pray, Father, you give them a big vision. And give them the grace to believe you for it. And Lord, I pray tonight for you to be glorified in them and through them. Bless every person. Bless every family that's represented in this church tonight. Fill us with your spirit, Father. And may we never forget that we are the children of the living God. Be glorified. We pray. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Where's he at? Where's the youngster at? It's your service. As you make your way back to your seats, I guess you can be seated. I've got the microphone, and I go right into another sermon. But uh, I, I want to close by saying one thing, well, a few things. Um, first of all, Pastor Rob, thank you for that message. I think the timing is perfect because we have a building and grounds meeting on Monday at um, 10 o'clock. So um, hopefully that message will be refreshed. Uh, with our building and grounds uh, team as they think about that. And uh, what wise words, as we saw in so many locations of God's word, um, of how big our God really is, how big he really is. And so thank you for that. Thank you for the perfect timing. How many of you enjoyed Pastor Rob this week? Amen. Amen. Thank you. Now, you, 
How many of you want to see him come back again next year? Anybody? All right. All right. So I'll pray about that, brother. <laughs> who, who don't want to have him to come back next year? Wow, Facebook's like, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, we're. Uh, I I don't let just anybody come and do revivals. I've been burnt a few times in the past, but Pastor Rob has come the last couple of years and and uh, has really really blessed us. And so I thank you, Pastor Rob. Be in prayer for him and Miss Jackie as they uh, travel back to California, as they try to reach the great state of California for Jesus. And um, and I know that they'll be praying for us. And just let me just kind of give you an idea of the impact that. Um, how God provides partnerships and things like that. I don't know how many of you know this, but for the last couple of years, our partnership with Emmanuel Baptist Church, they've sent a team of, uh, of senior high school uh, youth, and they've come and they've helped us. I don't know what we would have done um, without them the last couple of years. We've uh, built up our volunteer base. This year they will not be able to come, but I think that we are to a point where we can hopefully facilitate our own vacation Bible school this year. Uh, a couple of years ago, Hurricane Florence, some of you remember that. Um, it was through our partnership with Emmanuel Baptist Church that they sent us $28,000 in hurricane relief here. And we were wondering, how are we going to help the community? How are we going to reach out? God just laid it upon this man's heart, and they took up a love offering. And within a week or two, we had $28,000 here. Listen, God can do anything. And I know that you've probably heard me say that before, but I think it's good to also hear it uh, from a fresh perspective as well, if you will just believe. And I believe my whole heart that God wants to do great things here at Providence Baptist Church, here in this community. This community is not shrinking. It's not one of these communities in, in North Carolina that's shrinking. It's, it's expanding. It's growing. It's exploding uh, from 2016 to current. It's the second fastest growing community in Holly Ridge, but yet our attendance, and not just our attendance, the attendance in the surrounding area, churches aren't growing at that rate. So what does that mean? That means there's lost people all around us, and I believe that God has given us the mission. It's like I say, God has a mission. His mission has a church, and this church is in, in Holly Ridge. And so his church is Providence Baptist Church, and I believe he wants to do great things through us and in us and around us if we'll just submit, be obedient, be obedient. I think we've heard that once. We've heard that a thousand times all week long. And, of course, I've told Pastor Rob every night, preaching to me, if no one else needs it, I need it. And so um, thank you, Pastor Rob. Uh, be in prayer for him um, again. And uh, everybody enjoy this revival. Say amen. All right, if you really enjoyed it, stand up. <laughs> All right, I want to thank you guys for coming out, supporting great crowd tonight. Not sure what the final number is. I'll take a look at that in just a moment. But thank you for coming out, supporting Pastor Rob. Thank you for uh, the love offering and the love that you poured out. 73. All right, good job. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thanks for being a blessing to him. I'm going to ask if Sonia, Miss Jackie, and Pastor Rob can make their way to the back, and you can greet him, hug him, and uh, wish him well as he goes back to California, and um, tell him we'll see him next year. Um, Lord willing, Lord willing, we'll see him next year. We'll get to that in James eventually. But um, I hope that every heart and mind's clear. If God's dealing with your heart about something, um, you know, I'm always available. Our deacons are always available. You can reach out to your deacon. You reach out to me, and uh, we'd love to pray for you or even just sit down and listen to what you have to say. But what a blessing it's been this week. I hope and I pray that you've been revived. If not, I hope at least you've been challenged this week. I know that I have uh, far more than I wanted um, and anticipated, but I thank God uh, for that, and I thank him for his pressure. So uh, thank you guys for being here this week. Be safe on your way home. Don't forget, Sunday morning, 945 Sunday School, 11 o'clock worship, 5 o'clock Awana 545 Bible study. Make plans to be here uh, for that. All right, every heart, every mind clear. All right, I'm going to ask if Brother Jerry will close us in a word of prayer.